Okay, good morning, everyone. Oh, everyone can hear me okay online? All right. Okay, let's get into a time, just prayer, and then we'll uh, get into our teaching sessions. Father, we thank you once again for this beautiful week, oh God. We thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to come together and learn. And Lord, we thank you for this gift of life, oh God, where we can just, Lord, come together, Lord, in your presence, Lord. And even as we learn about the local church, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you will continue to speak in and through us, oh God, minister to our hearts, oh God. We commit this two hours of sessions into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so we we picked up uh, last class, we did up to chapter 9, the local church as the family of God. And we've come to page 92 on your books. Uh, we'll be talking about fathers, mothers, sons, and daughters in the local church family. So... Uh, what we have looked at is the house of God is a spiritual house. There's a way we must conduct ourselves. There are boundaries between the natural and the spiritual. Uh, we must have, you know, just as a family has certain cultures and values and purposes, uh, we must also have them. We briefly looked at uh, APC as our culture, value, and purposes and things that we desire and dreams that we desire to see as a local church. Uh, importantly, we looked at three family practices in a local church, uh, walk in brotherly love, uh, keeping the unity of the spirit, and then everyone works. So it's not, it's not one person doing all the work, everyone get together and work together. Okay, so page 92, fathers, mothers, sons, and daughters in the church family. Now, in the book of John, John, and even in uh, 1 John, in Paul writes to Timothy, uh, in, in the book of Ephesus as well, we see the mentioning of fathers and mothers. He says young children, young men. Uh, and so in a local church, we must understand there will be people from different age groups, right? Uh, there'll be like fathers, there'll be like mothers, there'll be young middle-aged right now when when we look at it in the natural we have people of different age but when we look at it in the spiritual aspect right people are in different stages of growth in a local church right so for example you may have 500 people in a church a congregation may have 500 people but in that 500 all of them are going through different levels of maturity some of them are just new they don't want they don't know much some of them have been with the lord for maybe about 10 years few of them are 20 years in the lord so all of them are in different levels of maturity now as a spiritual church we what we expect and what we assign to people will differ based on their spiritual maturity so something that we have is uh, I don't know if you've read about it, is life coaching. Right? Now, in our life coaching ministry at APC, what we do is we assign, if there are, if there are people, individuals within the church, they want to be you know, mentored or trained or coached in any area. So we have about six or seven areas. Right? So, uh, you know, workplace, then you have family, spiritual uh, maturity, so different areas, right? Oh, or, or even youth who want to be mentored. So they register, and accordingly, as a team, what we do is we allocate, you know, people to the right leaders who can mentor them. Now, in the natural, we are more tolerant to little ch children. We tend to overlook their mistake, but as the children grow up, we have to bring correction. Look at Galatians 4, 1 and 2. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. Now, as long as there's a child in the house, he or she will, you know, have certain privileges, right? Responsibilities may differ. 
Now, as the child grows up, the privileges sometimes reduce. For example, if your child, if a child is ten years old, he has certain privileges, right? I can't expect him to sit and study for three hours continuously, right? They are children. They study for one hour, they get distracted, they want to do something else. And we as parents, we understand. Right? They need a break. They need to play. Their attention span is very less. But as the child grows, now when you're in 10 standard and you're studying for your main, your board exams, 10 standard final exams, as a parent, what would you do? Say, hey, study. Right? Make sure you are able to study. And I'm not going to keep checking on them. Did you study for your exam? Did you study for the exam? Tomorrow is your final exam, 10 stand. No. The maturity grows, right? Now, once they step into college or university, right, and they may move to another country, I'm not calling up and saying, did you do your projects? In the university, the, your lecturers have given you projects. Did you do it? No. I'm not even going to check. I want to even know what they're doing. Why? Because their level of maturity is grown. Right, the same way, we must nurture everyone so that they're growing up to become fathers and mothers. So in the church, you will have people who are mature in age or even mature in the spirit, maturity in terms of spiritual, uh, in the spiritual aspect, and they can speak over your lives. But our responsibility in a family is, now I must make sure as a leader, that I am raising up people to come to that level of maturity that they will be able to raise up other leaders or mentor other younger people. You get what I'm saying, right? So there will come a time when, in the natural, right? A child who is 10 years old will grow up, 20, 30 years old, get married. Now once a child, once this, he becomes a man, right? Now, once this 10-year-old boy becomes 30, he's married, he has his own children. Now, imagine I, I go keep telling him, hey, did you, you know, did you go to work today? Are you, are you providing for your family? No. Why? Because by the time this child grows to that level, as leaders, we, and as parents, I must be able to speak into their lives and tell them, hey, these are responsibilities. You study, you work hard, you get a job, you work hard there, you do well, honor God, God will lift you up. You as a as a as a man, you have to provide for your house. As a as a you know, maybe as a woman, you will have to be able to either provide or be there at home for your family, for your children. So it's not something that is new. As they grow up, they learn it. Right? So right now all of us are students sitting here, but there'll come a time when responsibilities will be more you will have to move on from this stage right and look at this a son mentality and a servant mentality john chapter 8 verses 35 and a slave does not abide in the house forever but a son abides forever now let me just give you an overview of what what we're doing here what what we can understand now a son mentality, a servant, now I'm talking about in the natural, right? Say, for example, you have some a maid who comes home and helps you out. Now, why does she come? Does she, does, does she come because she likes to see your house clean? Why does she come? For a job. She's going to get paid for it. So every month or every week, whatever it is, she gets paid. There's a reward. And if she's a hardworking woman, if, or if she's a hardworking person, she does things in a good way, we'll remain, you know, we'll keep them. But imagine you have a maid who comes and who's always grumbling. No, this is not good. What Eventually, what will we do? You know what? It's okay. I think I'll choose somebody else. Because you don't seem to adjust with our, you know, with what's happening in our house. But when a son does a work in the house. What is the difference? He does the work because he belongs in that house. <laughs> One lesson I keep telling my kids is, I tell them, see, you need to keep your things neat. They do craft, cut 
paper, all of it, and they throw it everywhere. And they say, no, tomorrow, maid is coming, no, in the morning. She'll anyway sweep it. I said, that is different. She's coming, maid is coming, that is different. Whose house is this? Your house. So you have to keep it. So go, take the broom, clean it up. Now, why am I doing this? So that I get them to understand that this is your house and you are the son in this house. Now, the maid, maybe, you know, the month of October, I'll say, don't come. What will happen? Will I say this? Will I tell my son also, don't come? Be in school only or go somewhere else? No. Right? There's a difference in mentality, the way we think about things. Right? You have a servant menta mentality and there's a son mentality. A servant's commitment can change. If I am paying a certain amount to a maid and the other house says, hey, you know what? Listen, I'll give you double what they're giving you. Right? And you have to do the same amount of work. What will the maid do? Obviously, she'll go. He or she will go. Right? It doesn't affect, right? Of course, you may have built relationships, but for her, what is important is I'm getting more for less. Now, a son, it, you know, he's not going to say, hey, I like their house. You know, their family has a lot of things, so let me go and sit in their house. He's not going to do that. It can be a small hut. Or it could be a big palace. That is his house. Right? He knows where he belongs. A servant receives a reward for, his, for their work. But a son receives the inheritance for his work. Now, not for his work, but he receives an inheritance because he belongs there. Now, if you think of this, if, am I raising up servants or am I raising up sons and daughters? That's a question that we should ask ourselves as pastors and leaders. Right? Am I raising up people, leaders, who can only do something for me? Right? Or am I raising up leaders who can do something, impact the kingdom of God, where there's an inheritance? Right? So we, the way we raise up leaders will determine what kind of leaders they are. It's all about our mentality, right? Am I raising up a servant or a son? Now, characteristics of sons and daughters in the house. Number one, they demonstrate faithfulness. A son or a daughter demonstrates faithfulness. If I, if a parent, you know, shouts at, a, at their son, and I remember as a kid, I used to go, said this example, you know, I used to go cycling everywhere, and then, my mom will get upset and say, what is this? I told you to study. You're not... She will lock that cycle and keep the key. I'll be so sad. I, I want to ride the cycle. Right. She said, no. It's not like I'll go and find some other house and sit there. You're not... Till you give the key, I won't come. No. I, I used to... I was there in that house itself. Then I say, okay, if I do this, will you give me the key? Say, yeah, I'll give you the key. But this is what you should do. We demonstrate faithfulness to the house that we are in. Two, we serve as sons and daughters. If I am in my house and I'm cleaning my house, is it a shame? Right. You are part of this Bible college. If you're cleaning this Bible college, is it a shame? Right. Because it's your house. It, it's, it's where you're growing where you are, as of now, you are living. But you will move to your own places. And if you are maybe cleaning your, you know, tidying up your church or you're tidying up your home, it's not a shame because you're serving out of love and not out of obligation. Now, what is obligation? You have to do it. Oh, and then we take the, you know, I have to do this. Now, initially, you know, when your parents say, do this by force, and we take, oh, becomes an all. We need to change that mindset. Hey, I'm doing it for my house. It's not an obligation. So serving in the ministry, serving people is not an obligation. It's a, we're doing it out of love. Serving 
is we must have a heart of leaders rather than speaking their own ideas and interests. We welcome and draw people into the family, the house of God, instead of drawing people after themselves. Very important. We draw people into the house, right? So being like-minded is very important. Timothy worked alongside Paul at Philippi to raise up the church there. He served faithfully in Paul. So later on, Paul could refer to him as like-minded. That means what? The way I think, same way Timothy thinks. The way I think about ministry, the same way he thinks about ministry. The way I think about persecution is the same way Timothy thinks about persecution. The way I think about church, it's the same way Timothy thinks about the church. Being like-minded. And that's what we see here. As sons and daughters, we become like-minded with one mind. Right? This is why I'm doing what I'm doing. It should, it should be in one mind. Remember in Acts, what is one thing that was very, you know, that was standing out? They were of one accord. They were all praying together. Nobody was praying for their father, mother, praying for their sick. No, they were praying for one thing in one accord with one mind. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us. Right? So we serve as sons and daughters. Three, receive correction with a good spirit now. It's easy to give correction as leaders. Right? Now, See, as students, sometimes we can say, okay, yes, I, I received that correction. Yes, that's true. What you said is right. But there will come a time when you, each one of us, right, will become leaders. God will give us positions. And we are so used to giving correction. Yes. But we must also be humble enough to receive correction. Now, sons and daughters, we must be able to receive correction. Those correction could be small, could be big, right? And why do we need this correction? If you see now, people will correct us. If it's something that is important, we we take it, we apply it. I remember this one time, uh, many years back, at church, I finished preaching, and an elderly couple came up to me. And they said this to me, I like the way you preach, but you spoke too fast. Now, they're bringing correction to me. You spoke too fast. What you, you preached was good, but you spoke too fast. Now, I myself know sometimes I can speak really fast. So I, I said, oh, OK, I'm cool. you know, I, I understand. Sometimes. If I want to communicate something, I may speak too fast, but thank you for the feedback because I'm not preaching to puff up myself. I'm preaching so that everyone understands. Right? We must all understand what is being preached. And, and so I said, okay, now I will make it like I, I will purposefully learn to speak slowly. And it's for the benefit of everyone. Because growing up, English was, a, was my main language, right? We never spoke any other language. So it's very, you know, it's very fast. I can speak really fast. But when, he, when I got this feedback, I thought to myself, yes, I need to learn to talk softly, talk slower. Like the intensity, all of that is all right. But there are people from different backgrounds who are coming to church. English may not be their first language. There are some of them who are aged, senior citizens. So I need to make sure that I'm communicating something when I'm communicating. They must understand. So I received that feedback. And I took it. And as leaders, we also give feedback to many people. And that is common, right? We, we bring correction. We ask people to, uh, you know, to make changes whatever, uh, you know, but the point is, we must be willing to accept correction. Where were we? Yes, receive correction in good spirit. We have good spirit. When you give it, 
sometimes we cannot uh, you know control their what their what uh, their response is to correction but when we receive correction receive it in good spirit right four honor fathers and mothers in the house sons and daughters honor fathers and mothers that is those in leadership in the house now i think as a church right and most places not only here in apc but everywhere one thing we see is as young people teens uh, we normally honor we do that right we honor our um, fathers and mothers and that's a good thing to do right now what is dishonor dishonoring is to speak behind their back to mock what they are doing right uh, or to or to ridicule them feeling jealous about what they are doing these are ways of dishonoring but uh, but make sure that we honor our fathers and mothers in the house we see the incident of noah noah made a genuine mistake by drinking too much of wine now there is no indication that he drank <coughs> that he drank of the wine or got drunk again after this incident anyway when he saw the nakedness of his father all he did was go out and tell his brother when ham his son saw noah was naked because he had drank too much all he did was he went and told his brothers about it but what could have ham done he could have protected him honored him hey this is something that's happened here noah we know because the bible says that he was a righteous man god chose noah and said noah you have been righteous so i'm going to protect you and your family now ham should have thought of that but he didn't right uh, when he woke up noah woke up he realized what had happened and and he released the father's blessings on shem and japhet the two other brothers now genuine sons and daughters do not gossip expose and publish publicize genuine mistakes that have been made inside the house honest mistakes must be forgiven forgotten and covered very very important right genuine fathers and mothers do not gossip expose or publicize genuine mistakes will we make mistakes yes but my role and responsibility of a leader is to protect to cover to forgive and to forget right imagine jesus said to peter you made a mistake you should not have denied me now since you denied me you i'll tell you what you do you go back to fishing anyway now i've resurrected from the dead i'll find somebody else maybe john can lead the church at least he was there he was there at the cross at least he was there no nobody else was there only john was there okay john you be the leader did jesus do that no as a genuine leader he said he saw this very interesting no jesus didn't come back after the dead and say ah peter i was waiting to meet with you when i was on the cross i was thinking about you only right you said you won't deny me more than 3 times you denied me you were not there at the cross you were not there anywhere while i was struggling all alone did jesus pick up all the past jesus didn't he looked at peter and he said okay that is your past i don't look at it i'm going to look at what you can be now so peter you are the rock you are the one remember i prophet i i spoke into your life i said on this rock i will build my church you are like that rock you're going to lead this church so are you ready to do it right jesus restores him so as fathers and mothers we have to be able to come to a place of raising up leaders and honoring them in the house fathers and mothers in the house now we use the word fathering in a gender independent way right so it also includes mothering now god is the ultimate father but when when it comes to church when it comes to the leadership god will raise up people who can be your spiritual father and mother now we must be very very careful when it comes to spiritual father and spiritual mother why because this whole thing of spiritual father spiritual mother 
spiritual son, spiritual daughter can be taken out of context. And especially we see it not only in our nation, but we also see it in other nations as well, where people take advantage. Hey, I am your spiritual father, so you have to do what I tell you to do. Now, whether it's right or wrong, that is secondary. Spiritual father said, go and sell my house. I have to do it without thinking. Spiritual mother said, give all my you know, uh, property to the church. So I've gone and done it. Spiritual father says, you have to listen to what I am preaching. Nobody else. So now I have to listen to it. I'm, I have to, you know, there's no other option for me. Now, a true spiritual father or mother is one who can take a person from spiritual childhood to maturity. That is a true spiritual father or mother. Now, think of this. Say, for example, I go to a person and then I say, Pastor, I want to be your spiritual son. You say, okay. Now he goes to another nation and sits. Once in two weeks, he is calling me. Okay, how are you? How, how is your ministry? Right? Once in two weeks. Okay, this is what's happening in my ministry. Now, so there is two calls, maybe one hour each call, two hours in a month. He's speaking into my life. Now, is it... Now you think about it. Will he be able to take me into a greater place of maturity? Two hours in a in a month? I don't think so. Why? What 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 can he speak into my life? Firstly, we are in different countries. Now I'm not saying it can't happen, but it's very difficult for it to happen. Paul is writing and he's saying to Timothy, he is like my son. He is there with me. From 17 years old, I know this boy. I have raised him up. I have taken him in the second missionary journey. He has come with me. And now he I know that he's my spiritual son. We are in the same mindset. Right? So spiritual fathers and mothers, act, sorry, spiritual fathers and mothers, others leave a spiritual legacy for their children. They pass on a spiritual inheritance. This is what Paul did with Timothy. He said to Timothy, Timothy, you were 17 years old when I picked you up, about 17. Raised him up, took him, saw, he saw what ministry is. Now, did Timothy could have could Timothy have given up during the way? Yes. But he saw the trials. Maybe he would have thought, oh, I don't want to do this. What is this? get beaten, get into prison, keep walking everywhere, people, anywhere people can attack you. Why should I go through this? He could have gone back home. He could have done it. But he stayed on. And because he stayed on, Timothy, sorry, Paul told Timothy, now you are a leader in the church in Ephesus, made him a pastor, raised him up as a leader, and gave him something. Gave him the church in Ephesus. Gave him the role of leadership. Now, here are some ways by which we, as fathers and mothers, can nurture people. Firstly, yes. when it comes to our context in the times that we are living in, hmm. students or just like growing in the ministry, who are our spiritual father and mother? Is it only the pastors that we can connect to, or anything that anybody who God leads us who are in the ministry? that we can consider as spiritual father and mother for us? Yes, that's a good question, Akhil. I would say this. You can consider anybody who is spiritually mature to speak into your life. Right? Now, something in APC is we don't, we don't use the word spiritual father. He's my spiritual father. She's my spiritual mother. Right? But if you want people, like it could be somebody from who you know from childhood. It's not necessary just because we are your, you know, we are your teachers here. Uh, you know, we must be your spiritual father or spiritual mother. No, right? It could be anybody else, right? But the point, the role of the spiritual father and mother is to take a person from a place of spiritual maturity to a higher place of maturity. So it can be anyone. But even as we 
you know, even as we get into this, we must be very careful. Right? We must understand what is the role. Uh, there should not be any, you know, overpowering, manipulation. All these things we must avoid. Yes, yes, it can. It can definitely. It can. You can have a spiritual mother, for, father for ten years. And then maybe you, you know, move to another city. Obviously, you'll need another spiritual, like, yeah. So another thing is, you don't always need somebody, right? After ten years, you know, you you can you can have them as friends or people who you can you know ask guidance from, right? Now it's not necessary. You have to have. I don't have any spiritual father or mother. Yeah. That is good, right? As you, as especially when they are new in the look. See, Timothy, best example. Paul and Timothy is a beautiful example. Timothy was young; he had no clue what's happening, right? But he was a believer in the church. There was a good report. Now he didn't sign up for all these things, but Paul took Timothy, raised him up, and Timothy could have just gone away, right? But he didn't, and so Paul calls him a son because he saw him grow, saw him grow in maturity. That Paul put Timothy above the overseers and deacons that are already in the church. Now it could be that, you know, I would say maybe 15 or 20 years, even if you keep 20 years. So Timothy was not even 40 years old. But he's got deacons, overseers already in the church. Now he's going, and that's why Paul is saying, you don't don't look at your age, Timothy. You are a leader of the church. And you are going to lead. So when you choose overseers, deacons, you know, remember the criteria he gives. Uh, so yeah, one, spiritual fathers and mothers can change. Two, you don't really always need one when you lead, reach a level of maturity. Pastor, uh, Matthew 23, 9, hmm. Jesus is saying like, do not call anyone on earth your father, hmm. for one is your father, he who is in heaven. Sorry, that's Matthew. 23.9. Yeah. Yeah, so we must see the context. Okay, so here he's talking about the Father in heaven. Right? Verse 9. But you are not you are not to be called rabbi. Okay, verse 9. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have no have one father, and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called teacher, for you have one teacher, the Christ. Now, we must understand the context. Now, Paul, now Jesus is he's talking to the crowds, he's talking to the people, right? And he's trying to tell them, listen, I am from the Father. This whole of 23, he's rebuking the, the fathers of the law, and he's rebuking the teachers of the law. He's saying, you people are pretending to be fathers of the law, but you don't know anything of the law. You people are trying to be teachers of the law, but you are hypocrites. So he's rebuking them. He's saying, so he's talking to the crowds and saying, you don't call these people your fathers. You'll end up in trouble. Don't call these teachers, these rabbis who you see, don't call them teachers. Because you, they are blind people leading the blind. They don't know what they're saying. So he's, you must understand the context. So Jesus is saying, he's talking to the people, the, the, the crowds there, and his disciples also were there. He's saying, listen, you have one father, a father in heaven, and you have one teacher who is Christ. Right? Now, other places, people call, you know, he, Nicodemus, right, was a leader, a rabbi. Now, Jesus recognized his... He says, being a leader, you don't, you, you don't know these things, right? But he recognizes their leadership. So it's here he's talking on a completely different context. Here, remember, this is the church has not yet been established. Right? Here we're talking about natural spiritual fathers and mothers. Right? That means people around us who God can use to speak into our life. Right? So the, these are two different things. Right now, establish how do how can what are some of the ways we can be fathers and mothers and how do we nurture people? Very important. 
establish a personal relationship. Only if I establish a relationship with you, will I be able to speak in your life. Right? So for example, you know, Vimal is here. So Vimal, Vimal says, okay, I finished my course, I go back. Now I can't keep telling Vimal, come, I'll, I'll minister to you. Come, I'll minister to you. No. Vimal say, it's okay, thank you, Pastor. I have people there right, in my hometown. Why? Because now, if a true spiritual father or mother will speak into that person's life, develop a personal relationship so the other person is willing to listen, if I don't develop a relationship, why will he or she listen? No. Two, go past having just a superficial level of relationship. You know what is superficial? Just on paper. He is father, this one is mother, and this is son. Spiritual father, spiritual mother, and this is my spiritual son. It's very superficial. No. Meaning, you have to come to a place where you correct, rebuke, and you know, bring corrections, exhort, encourage. All of that should be there. Right? Exercise a positive influence. Now, deal with the person's character. Now, if I want to speak into your life, or somebody wants to speak in my life, that we must deal with the person's character. There are things in our life which needs to be changed. I have to speak it. If I want to see you become a better leader or a good leader, I have to deal with your character. I cannot say, okay, do what you want and then finish your Bible college and go. Now, even if I do that, there's not much of a responsibility on me. But as a good leader, I must be willing to correct things in, in your life or in my life. Right? Deal with character. These are things I see that is not right. Change it. Now, the other person may get offended, may feel I'm never going to talk to you again. That is not my issue. Why? Because as a leader, I'm trying to speak into your life. Now, again, the way I do it, I shouldn't be arrogant and rude while bringing correction. Right? I should do it in the right way. Just because I'm a leader, I have no right to be rude and arrogant to you and brash. I must learn to be kind, yet be truthful. Right? Encourage people to press in for themselves, uh, and we do not feel insecure if they exceed and go beyond what we are. Now, if there's a person who plays guitar or is a good worship leader, picture this. I tell him, hey, you come home twice a week. Okay, You come home, and let's just worship together. And then as we are worshiping together, you know, maybe I'm helping him out. I'm saying, you know, why don't you sing this line? You know, in prophetic worship, you can add whatever the Lord is putting in your heart. You do this. You, you know, these are the song dynamics. So these are the chords you can stay on. These are songs which you can spend more time on. Now, what am I doing? I'm speaking. Now, imagine a one year down the line, he becomes a better worship leader than me, better, you know, better in terms of leading worship. And, and playing the instrument has become much better than me. And I know it. I need to be in a place of security. I should never get insecure. Or oh, how come he got better than me? If I become insecure, I have failed as a leader. You understand this? right? Because my responsibility is to get people to a higher level of maturity. And if they exceed or get better than who we are, we should celebrate that. What did King Saul do? David is better than me. Where is he? Let me search for him and kill him off. That's, that's, he was insecure. All he had to do was, OK, my time is anyway going to end. I can't be the king forever. God has already chosen the other king. Might as well help him and get him ready for, the, uh, for being the king. But that didn't happen. right? Train people for their God-appointed destiny and release them at the right time. No strings attached. That means what? You've trained up a, peop a person. It's been 10 years. You made him the assistant youth pastor in your church. Now this youth pastor says, hey, I got an opportunity to be the, uh, you know, to be a pastor in this church, in another ministry. 
and don't hold on to him and say you stayed with me for 10 years you have to stay for another 5 years only then i'll let you go who are we to stop them who are we to stop god's call on their life we should never do that right release people bless them help them to get into what god wants them to do right now how do we become a family we develop community right what is christian community right there are a few points here uh, quite a few points but let's get, quickly get into this christian community is uh, it is a community of believers who relate to one another right? i'm able to relate to you now we won't go too much into detail right um, we'll just pick up words from here and try to uh, you know just learn from that relate to one another as students do you relate to one another yes second year batch you relate to one another now five years down the line you all meet each other reunion will you all relate to each other yes or no you will relate to each other why because you have built a relationship and what will you all talk about hey when we were in bc remember we did this remember we did that hey what are you doing now in your ministry oh really and then you call each other your nicknames that you'll have made in the college right you relate to each other now imagine you we have a bible college reunion will you be able to relate to the 2010 batch students no because that's a different so what i'm trying to say is in a community believers relate to each other we understand each other two in a community belie believers relate to one another where life to life nurture happens so that christ like character is formed people grow in godliness so we relate to an, each other so that christ like nature is formed right we 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 become like christ now we can relate to each other and waste our time we can spend hours relating and wasting but here it says that as believers we relate to one another but the the whole point of that relationship is to nurture each other into christ likeness three it is a community of believers who relate to one another in a manner where we serve each other in love and compassion right? we serve each other in love and compassion then uh, in a manner where we empower and equip one another for the life for life in this world right? we empower each other we equip one each other each other we love each other and we reach out or evangelize and minister together we relate to one another in a manner where we understand that we are god we are building god's kingdom we are part of god's kingdom and we are going to fulfill the great commission together we relate to one another to understand that we are part of god's kingdom and we manifest uh, kingdom values we release the work of god wherever we are now yesterday even as we were as i was you know the sermon that we were preaching on something that really encouraged all of us was you know in the book of revelation i know i'm just moving a little bit away but i want to bring this point out you know many of us may have lost our loved ones right and in revelations we yesterday we talked about this the marriage supper of the lamb where jesus calls all of us as believers we sit together and and you know dine with him now it is such a powerful image of what is going to happen where we will all sit together and you know just be with the lord celebrating that oneness so when christ looks at us he's not looking at us as people who are different meaning you are in this department or you are from this denomination no he looks at us as one right of course we all are parts of different local churches but when he looks at us he looks at us as one so we always remember that what christian community is not so we saw what it is 
right? We love each other, we honor each other, we respect each other, we build each other up, we you know, uh, empower each other for kingdom mindset, kingdom values. Now, what is it not? It is not a Christian garb for worldliness. If believers get together and watch an indecent movie, it does not make us a true Christian fellowship. Right? Now, we must be careful. Especially in times of fellowship, what are we speaking? What are we saying? Right? I'm not saying keep everything as thus says the Lord, but be mindful of what the fellow, what kind of fellowship are we involved in. Be mindful of that. Two, it's not an escape from going out into the world to make all disciples. Right? That means it's not like I go and get involved in everything that the world is doing and saying, hey, I'm making disciples. No. It's not a substitute for true spiritual fellowship. I cannot say, hey, I like the people in church. I like what happens there. I have a few friends there. So I'll go to church just to meet them, to have fellowship with them. One and a half hours the service. After that, a lot of time is there. So we can spend time together. No, that's not the reason why we go to church. Remember that God does the house cleaning. God will clean up our the church. Uh, judgment begins in the house of God. So it is very important for us as leaders to keep the church in order, keep it clean. So how can you and I keep the church clean? Okay, what we'll do is we'll take a break, we'll come back, and then we'll look at this, How, uh, and then we'll go further as well, right? Take a break. <laughs>